Well, did anybody notice some resistance before the program? I think I gave a warning last week that a very potent and uh, powerful place of practice is when we've made some commitment and seems like it was a good commitment to make, but then when it's the time to get out of bed or get in the car or get on Zoom, it's uh, there's this part of the mind that resists. It's almost like an unconscious fear of learning, seeing what we haven't seen. And so there can be, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we took the time to really check in with everybody in this class. There's probably any number of ways we approached, you know, we got interested in mindfulness meditation, being more present in life dozens of times only to be deflected or distracted or putting it off maybe later. So it's really useful <clears throat> for the duration of the course to get really interested in, like if we're gonna be mindful in any moment, being mindful in those moments when the mind is constructing excuses why you shouldn't tune in next Tuesday night, for example. Really give yourself these six weeks. And not only that, it's not just about showing up for the Tuesday night class, but with whatever amount of time you're able to put aside during the day. Remember, you know, ideally it'd be 30 minutes or two times 20 minutes, but five minutes is better than no minutes. So even just sitting down for a couple minutes gives the mind something, gives that supportive space to get a sense of what it is to turn the mind you know the attention usually is drawn into the objects of experience and the conditioned reaction we have to these experiences like i like this experience i don't like that and pretty much on and on throughout the day day after day week after week that characterizes our existence as a human being. The mind is obsessing about an experience, meaning it has had an experience and it's thinking about it. It's reacting to it. It's trying to hold on to a nice one or get rid of or blame somebody for having a bad experience. And there are very few moments, it's relatively rare for our mind to recognize clearly that this moment of experience is being known. And so, honestly, reflecting back on today, how many moments was there a very simple but clear recognition that this experience is being known? I'm just gonna take a moment and mute everybody again. Good. And uh, of course, during the discussion time, people can unmute themselves, but. Somehow I got muted. When I muted everybody, it muted me, which usually it doesn't mute the host. Sorry about that. You can hear me now, I take it. <laughs> I thought, when I saw Kyle waving, I thought, Kyle, that's a little rude to be waving to your friend. And I saw Keith waving, I thought, oh, maybe Keith and Kyle know each other. Now, this is just an aside, that's called delusion. When your mind makes up stories, and then it's not just, totally fine that the mind makes up stories, but then the mind believes that story is somehow the truth, right? It doesn't bother to look at the lower left corner and realize you're muted. <laughs> Very funny. Okay. So yeah, I was just saying, it's very interesting how rare of an event it is when there's a simple moment of reflective knowing. Ah, 
And now, even now I'm talking about it, and are you aware that this moment is being known, whatever that's like for us? And you see, it doesn't require tension for me right now, for me to realize hearing my own voice speaking is being known. It's almost like um, a matter of switching what the mind is interested in. The attention generally is going out to the sense experience and our reaction. But now we're interested, we're in a, in a sense, and this isn't a perfect sense, the awareness is turning inward, recognizing that there is this ongoing knowing consciousness and is recognizing what consciousness is knowing. I know it sounds a little weird to say that because, and I think I mentioned this last week, but I'm not, I'm not remembering for sure, but we can be conscious in the sense of like, I could drive from one place to another if it's familiar, but I might not be mindful at all. Like I make the right turns, I slow down when I'm supposed to speed up, etc. But when I get back home, having driven that, you know, 15 minutes, I might not be able to recall doing it because I was lost in thought. But yet, clearly I was seeing and I was responding as I was driving, but I wasn't reflectively aware that this was being known, seeing is being known, moving the steering wheel is being known. So in the same way, when we take up the particular training, like let's say you're feeling as an anchor for your meditation practice, you're feeling the chest and abdomen, and you're noticing a very ordinary expansion as the breath comes in, contraction as the breath goes out. So that's just movement or sensation, right? And uh, can when we're sort of training like, as that chest is expanding, the belly is expanding, can there be this reflective knowing that these sensations are being known now? And if I get bored, can there be that reflective knowing, oh, boredom is being felt, being known? Or if you think you're doing a really good job when, when you're meditating later tonight, then mindfulness then recognizes Oh, having the thought, I'm a really good meditator, is what's being known. So it's really answering the question, what's the mind knowing? Or what's the mind doing? Oh, it's, it's knowing this. It's doing this. And I mentioned last week, you know, we have a mind. Clearly, it is as relevant to my life as anything is. But I've, we've all probably have been uniquely, strangely uninterested in understanding the nature of the mind. But the mind, the knowing itself, can be interested in the mind, in what the mind is doing, what it's knowing. And in particular, how the mind is relating. So as you get more moments tonight in the sit and then at home during the week, as you get more moments where there's some steadiness or continuity of present moment awareness, then you can even drop in the question, well, what's, what's the attitude? What's the flavor of the mood right now? So you're just aware that this filter, this mood, this coloring is the way that it is right now. Oh, there's grumpiness being known, being felt, or Maybe the mind is light and happy. Okay, lightness, happiness is being known. And the key about mindful awareness is that it's non-judging. And I may have mentioned about the mirror as a nice simile. In the same way, if we had a really good mirror now, that mirror would simply, if it's a good mirror, and accurately reflect whatever is going on in front of the mirror. And this is why it's a really good simile because the effort the mirror needs to make to reflect what's going on in front of it, minimal, right? Doesn't exhaust the mirror. 
You could have something very subtle and complex going on in front of the mirror, no problem reflecting it. You could have something very ordinary going on in front of the mirror, no problem. Could be something really disgusting, no problem. You know, could be the Buddha, Jesus, whatever, doing a backflip, no problem. So the, in the mirror, not only is it just a sort of natural function of the mirror to reflect back what's happening, so it doesn't get tight, doesn't need to try hard to reflect back, but there's no judgment. And then the other really interesting thing about the simile that fits our practice, this is a more subtle point, but the mirror in no way is stained or contaminated by what it's reflecting back. And this is something very deep uh, and essential to discover in our um, <clears throat> mindfulness practice. That like giving an example now, if I'm some, something's really triggered a lot, a lot of anger, self-righteousness, and then fortunately there's a moment or some moments of mindfulness. So then the wisdom, the knowing mind knows, oh yeah, there's anger. Feels like this in the body, looks like this in the mind. Anger's like this. It's just anger being known. The knowing isn't angry. There's an emotion. There's some movement in the body. Because emotion, you know, is both physical and mental. Right? There's some mo a movement in the body, some movement in the mind. But the knowing of it remains uncontaminated by what it's knowing, that there's anger happening right now. And it's very strange when this insight, it's a real realization, it's an insight in the sense of you're seeing something about the nature of the mind. Most, I'm guessing most of you haven't seen fully, clearly yet, that the knowing will always be, remain unentangled with what's being known. Even something, here's something, because this is, possible to happen to many of you tonight when we're sitting you might be sleepy because you had a busy day so you might notice a lot of sleepiness so remember now if that happens to you during the sit tonight and you know you're feeling that ordinary heaviness in the body that comes with being sleepy and the mind gets sort of fuzzy like it does right and then just check okay there's these qualities that are being known and then the qualities are like this, but is the knowing in any way sleepy? I had it when I was practicing in Burma as a Buddhist monk for five months. One of my teachers, Saida Ujanaka, would say this a lot. He'd say, Isn't it possible, like if you're driving and it's a really foggy day, isn't it possible to be crystal clear that it's foggy? You know, the mind like totally gets, okay, it's foggy. It's like this. This is the experience right now. So even though it's hard to see because there's a lot of fog, the awareness that it's foggy can be very balanced and clear. And that awareness that it's foggy isn't contaminated by the fogginess. So the same thing like when you're feeling depressed or you're feeling confused or you're feeling really restless. There's some, the mind or the heart has this capacity to be, to sort of align with this unstainable, unflappable aspect of awareness. Now I'm not making the point that you are this unflappable, steady, um, aspect of awareness. What I'm saying is, as we get to know the mind and get to know this quality of the mind we call knowing or awareness, it really teaches us something about being free in the midst of a lot of messiness and complexities that come with being a human being and being in relationship with others, right? It's complex difficult even when you're quite privileged like I have a pretty comfortable privileged life 
in many different ways. And I find it really difficult being a human being. It's complex. It's unreliable, right? Haven't found perfect satisfaction yet. And I have it pretty good. So by understanding how awareness like that, awareness is in a way, this mirror-like quality of the mind is our teacher teaching us equanimity, teaching us how to value balance no matter what's going on. So that's why it gets highlighted a lot in Buddhist meditation practice. Any questions about that before we adjust and settle in for some sitting time? You can go ahead and unmute yourself if you have a question or a comment related to what I've said. Or... Yes, I have, a, I have a question. Sure, Kabir? Um, I was wondering if um, you could talk briefly on the difference between knowing and understanding. Yeah, good question. So if you didn't hear, Kabir, it's the question, what's the difference between knowing and understanding? Well, one way to think about that is uh, knowing is, so, it's almost like we're collecting a data point. So every moment when that knowing aspect of the mind is in balance, then it, what does it know? It knows it's like this now, that this experience is being known. And that's like a, a data point. And when you have a lot of data points, a lot of moments when the knowing isn't entangled with a mood or some view, some fixed view, but it's really more this clean knowing, this awareness, so that there may be a mood or there may be a view, but the knowing, because it's in a relatively pure state, I'll notice that there's a mood. I'll notice that there's this self-righteous view or opinion that I have. Oh yeah, there's that. So in that way, the knowing doesn't get uh, distorted by those things that can distort it, distort it. So knowing collects data and the cumulative data, cumulative number of moments where there's good knowing transforms your understanding. So deepening of understanding depends on good data Good data comes from moments of mindfulness or this is being known, this is being known, this is being known. So they're very much related. The transformation of understanding, the deepening of understanding, the development of wisdom, different ways of saying the same thing, come about from moments of knowing, simple moments of knowing. And we have to be, because a lot of us, you know, especially if you read Buddhist books, the ego wants to go right to the wisdom, right to having deep understanding. But that ends up being kind of an imitation. And a lot of us at times are imitating like having the Buddha's wisdom because it's compelling as a philosophy. So we read it, we understand it intellectually, makes sense to us on that intellectual level. And then we kind of want to own it. But it's not really our understanding yet. It's just we're attracted to the ideas. The way to real understanding is to work with our actual present moment experience, develop that balanced present moment awareness and have moments of clear knowing or clear seeing. Oh, this is what's being known. This is my experience being known. This is being known. And that patient, persistent, moment by moment, present moment awareness is what deepens our understanding. Thanks again, Kabir, great question. Thank you so much. And the reason I asked that is because uh, my Buddha, <laughs> my mentor, I call him Buddha, he, um, he said an understanding was knowledge plus your experience. And that's basically what you just said. <laughs> uh, 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 thank you. Great, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Good. Anything else before we stretch out a little and do our sit tonight? Great. So feel free to adjust your body, stand if you want for a moment or two. And as folks are settling back into sitting posture, I'll just mention a few things about uh, 
how to sit. But I'll wait a moment while you take care of your body. Yeah, and of course, we're all at home. We're not at a meditation center where we have all the nifty cushions and benches and straight back chairs. But the, the two principles in terms of meditation posture, one is to really reflect on how to have enough comfort so the discomfort isn't disturbing the meditation too much. And the other is how to have a posture that supports clarity. Because, you know, if we just wanted comfort, we could all have a lazy boy or something like that and kick back and we'd be pretty comfortable. And it might actually be a good sit for three to five minutes. But very quickly, sleepiness, tranquility, and then sleepiness would overcome the alertness. And the mind would have the balance of alertness with the tranquility. It would have a lot of tranquility and not much alertness. And then the mind would either get, fall asleep or we get into a trance-like state. So with our posture, you know, everyone where you're sitting, where you're at, you just find what for you feels like the appropriate compromise between comfort and uprightness. For somebody who has a lot of chronic pain, you're not gonna fall asleep. So you can even do meditation in the lying down position with a little pillow under your head, arms to the side, legs comfortably apart, something like that. Or if you have lower back pain, put a chair under your calves. There's different ways to do that. So, but if you're somebody who um, tends to fall asleep, then even sitting in a chair and using the back of the chair can be too much. So you might wanna get a little pillow, support your lumbar, right? But the back of your shoulder blades, they're not against the chair. So you're leaning like I am now on the couch I have a little lumbar support. And so if I, if I was really sleepy, then I would come into a posture like this. You see, so posture is a little bit like medicine. And then the question every morning or evening when you sit, what kind of medicine would be good given how my mind and body's doing today? How can I sit so there'll be, as best I can tell, some balance between the comfort and alertness? because that's what we want the posture to do, support comfort and alertness. So go ahead and make adjustments. And once you feel re relatively settled, just like we're talking to our body as a good friend and reminding it, it really helps as best we can. It won't be perfect to hold the body still during the 25 minutes, 30 minutes of this set. When the body is relatively still, it's easier for the mind to settle, become clear and stable, and to help feel at home in the body. You might wanna take a couple of longer, deeper breaths in and out, but slow it down. Let it be really relaxed and easy as you fill the lungs and as you empty the lungs. And we'll do this maybe four or five times and slow it down as much as you comfortably can. As if we have all the time in the world to fill and empty the lungs. And maybe one more time, but take your time. And whenever you're done with the next exhalation, just allow the breathing to continue. 
But now don't try to consciously control the breath because you know that the body knows how to breathe without any mental control. We'll take a few moments and do a simple body scan. So allowing the awareness to open and settle now throughout the head and face. This willingness to be aware of whatever sensations are here in the forehead, the brow. Soften, relax, allow. And the entire scalp sides and back of the head. We're giving permission for any sensations in the head here to just be the way they are. The ears. Feel the eyes, including the eyelids touching here. If you can feel the air touching the skin of the face, is it cool? Is it warm? Noticing any tension anywhere in the face, around the eyes, around the brow, around the jaw. And for a few more seconds, just making peace with the sensations in the head and face. Letting them be the way they are. And then simply opening to the throat. Feeling the sides of both, both sides of the neck. The back of the neck. opening and accepting the sensations at the tops of the shoulders and the shoulder joints. In a kind way, feeling the whole head, the shoulders, the throat and neck. Practice allowing everything to be the way that it is here. And then begin to be curious about the biceps. For example, noticing where clothes, the sleeves are touching the skin. Maybe noticing the relative warmth there under the biceps and the armpits. Feel the bend of the elbows. The forearms the wrists, and the ordinary sensations at the back of the hands. Notice the touch points there where the hands are making contact, the palms, both thumbs, index fingers, middle fingers, the ring finger, and the smallest fingers, both arms, feel the weight of the arms. And appreciating now as we feel down through the torso, just as it is, we're not trying to fix anything, in a way we're learning or maybe relearning how to be intimate. So just feeling the upper third of the torso, so the chest and the upper back, collarbones. And you might sense the structure of the rib cage as you feel it gently expanding and contracting here.
and settling into the middle third of the torso, the solar plexus and the kidneys and lower ribs. Just let the awareness settle here. Feel what you feel. Let things be. Now the lower third, the belly, the lower back. You see how present moment awareness really has a quality of kindness and love because of this willingness to include whatever's here now in the belly and the lower back. And then begin to feel the structure of the pelvis, the groin, the floor of the pelvis, sits bones. And then both thighs. Bend at the knees. And noticing any sensations down through the shins and the calves. Ankles. and the sides and tops of the feet, bottoms, heels, toes, both feet just as they are. Whole body, all the sensations. Notice how the body is quite alive with sensation. And the simple truth, sensation is being known. Heat is being known. Vibration is being known. All the many different qualities of the sensations that are coming and going. And now we go from the body scan to feeling the breath naturally move in the body. Breathing in is like this. Breathing out is being known. It's like this now. And in a very relaxed way. Notice, can the mind be aware of the breath coming in from the beginning of the breath until the very end of the in-breath without controlling or forcing? And then simply being aware of the out-breath from the beginning to the end. And in this way, putting everything else down for a while. So it's a little exercise in non-distraction, one half breath at a time.
and simply be willing to begin again and again. So we're taking a little time initially with the breath to really explore in a light way, in a friendly way, the possibility of non-distraction. And what really helps is to do it in a relaxed way, to actually be interested in connecting with the sensations of breathing in from the beginning and sustaining that attention to the very end, from the beginning of the out-breath to the very end. And if you feel like you need more of a support, you can silently repeat something simple. It could be as simple as breathing in while you're breathing in, or breathing in as being known, breathing out as being known. That can give a little bit more support for the continuity of attention. But if you don't need that mental phrase, then just do the practice in silence. And again, remember to relax. There's no need to get frustrated when you catch or notice the mind's wandered. But instead, in a simple, persistent way, be willing to begin again. Feel the body that's sitting here. Bodies like this. Then feel the movement of the breath right here in the experience of the body. And then take up this simple, beautiful training to connect with the in-breath, Sustaining attention, connect with the out-breath, sustaining attention. Can we be intimate with the ordinary breathing process without getting tight about it? And allow this continuity of awareness with the breath to expand so that as you're breathing in, you can be aware of the sensations of the whole body sitting. And as you're breathing out, you're actually feeling the breath, but also knowing the totality of the experience of the body sitting. Breathing in, experiencing the whole body. Breathing out, experiencing the whole body. So if you need a phrase, you can repeat that. Breathing in, experiencing the whole body. Breathing out, experiencing the whole body.
and initially stay connected as you breathe in, aware of the whole body, not so much to the idea or mental image of the body, but connecting, being aware of the actual diversity of sensation that is the body as you breathe in and as you breathe out. And notice how this whole body awareness is quite calming for the mind and body. So appreciate the calming effect as you breathe in and the calming effect as you breathe out. Don't miss that part of the present moment. Breathing in, experiencing the whole body. Breathing out, experiencing the whole body. And when you get some steadiness, some continuity, then noticing the calming, breathing in, calming the whole body. Breathing out, calming the whole body. This is a natural development and there's some continuity of present moment awareness. And with more and more steadiness, continuity of present moment awareness, the pervasive calm in the body matures into more of a lightness that we could call joy or joyful interest. And the Buddha's instruction here is breathing in, experiencing that joy, that lightness, 
breathing out, experiencing that joy or lightness. Now it may not be the predominant experience in the heart, that joy, but learning to recognize that lightness of the heart, that buoyancy, even when it's faint, as you breathe in, as you breathe out. as if you're beginning to sense a beautiful enlivened smile throughout the body, the heart, and the mind. A whole life, just a light, sweet smile. As we breathe in, as we breathe out, And when there's significant joy, it naturally settles and matures into a kind of more resonant ease of the heart, a kind of happiness of contentedness. As if there's something in the heart that's relaxing. Ah. So breathing in, see if you can experience, touch into this ease. Breathing out, experiencing this ease, ease of heart. Right here, right now, breathing in, experiencing ease. Breathing out, experiencing ease.
course, there are many things we imagine we might need to think about or plan or worry about. But it's very healing to put all that down for now. Breathing in, willing to experience the ease of the heart, to keep it in mind. Breathing out, experiencing the ease in the heart. And this ease, when it gets some momentum, it leads onward toward a more beautiful quality of dispassion, or you might call it a spaciousness, where the mind is less and less pushed around by its thoughts. It doesn't mean that there aren't thoughts. The thoughts become more like background sound, like the sound of birds. And the mind doesn't feel so pushed or tormented by its thoughts. And this in turn quiets the mind down. Precisely because the mind isn't so identified with thought. So breathing in, noticing that quality of dispassion, space. Breathing out, noticing that spacious quality of dispassion. And now do your best to sense that dispassion, that sense of space, and allow your eyes to open if they've been closed. And you're not looking at the computer, just gaze down toward the floor. And of course now aware of seeing and hearing aware of sensation and breathing, aware of thought. And this sense of letting nature be nature. Letting seeing be seeing and hearing be hearing. Thinking is just thinking. So we're getting used to getting where we can respect this quality of dispassion, evenness, balance, equanimity. These are different words. For this quality of the heart that can develop in practice. So when you're ready, just adjust and move and stretch out. And we'll, in just a moment, once people are adjusted, we'll take a little time and check in. I mentioned last week how useful it is to hear people's comments and questions, what you've been learning, what's been challenging, what's felt like a place of a lot of learning. So these comments and questions um, may you know, be good for you to bring up and good to hear whatever my response might be. But collectively, we learn a lot hearing other people check in about their practice. It really, in a sense, normalizes what it is to have a mind, 
and to cultivate awareness, this awareness of the mind that we're doing so centrally, uh, central to this practice that we're doing. And so first just recalling the three sections of the sit. A nice way to settle in is to do a body scan. Some days it could be relatively quick. Other days you might, might be the most of your time is spent just in a very methodical, loving, generous way, connecting with each place in the body. You're not favoring pleasant spaces in the body over unpleasant spaces. Each place in the body gets its due. And you're just sort of remembering, oh yeah, I can be aware. I can be curious. Like all those wholesome qualities, I can be accepting. I can be kind. Right? I can be fearless if we're like opening to pain. So we move through the body methodically a couple times or once and then aware of the whole body. And then it's nice to use the breath. There's something the Buddha really highlighted the breath um, as one of the primary practices because it's relatively not charged. Now, for some of you, the breath will be emotionally charged. Let's say as a child, you had a lot of asthma or something like that. Then it's probably not a good meditation anchor if that's the case for you. And there's many others. But for a lot of people, the breath is quite suitable. And as you saw, we were only specifically with the breath for a little bit of the sit, where, where I was really suggesting that you use the breath as a little training in non-distraction. Okay, can I be aware of the in-breath moment by moment by moment by moment until the breath is completely in and then with the out-breath? And it just makes it easy, like it's a short enough interval that we can actually find some success. I mean, that's a real victory to be in a balanced, non-tight way, to be attentive to the ordinary sensations of the ribcage expanding and then contracting, whatever that is, you know, 15 seconds, probably, maybe a little bit less, unbroken, unwavering, relaxed, kind attention. That's a little victory. And then you do it again for the out breath. And then you do it again for the in breath. And you really build your confidence that the simple activity of mindful awareness can slowly, with practice, become more and more continuous. And then we get lost in thought. And then we forgive ourselves. And we notice having been lost in thought feels like this. So we take a moment, be, instead of rushing back to the meditation anchor, the breath, take a moment, doesn't take too long, and simply acknowledge having been distracted, this is what it feels like in the body and the mind. Oh, it's like this now. Because sometimes, especially if you've been caught in a distraction for several minutes, you might have whipped up, like if you were worrying about something, a lot of body tension, right? The whole system, body, mind, emotional system might be really activated, depending on what you were thinking about. And then you really need to acknowledge that. Okay, now this is moving. Now this is being felt. Other times, distractions are going to be relatively neutral. And as soon as you notice the distraction, it almost like a, a little bubble pops and the mind is completely balanced again. Because it, whatever that disturbance or that distraction was, it wasn't strongly charged one way or the another. It wasn't triggering a lot of greed or a lot of fear and aversion. So then when it goes away, when the distraction goes away, and awareness knows, oh yeah, the mind was distracted, then the mind's right back to its balanced place. So then you can quickly come back, breathing in, aware of the whole body, breathing out, aware of the whole body. And remember this sequence. So specifically with the breath, touching at the nostrils, feeling of expansion and contraction. So just a very particular part of the body where you feel that movement of the breath. And just train for a few minutes at least and being non-distracted and relaxed. Not tight and non-distracted. You want to emphasize both the alertness 
the non-distractedness, and the ease and relaxation. So work with something very specific. And if the breath is charged, you can work with hearing. You could work with touch points like feeling your, you can't see them, but my hands are just resting on my thighs. See that simple touch point could work, right? Or you could switch from touch points, feel your hands on your thighs for a few seconds, feel the sits bones against the cushion or chair for a few seconds back to the hands, but we're just doing a little training and non-distractedness and then move to a more inclusive. So from specific to inclusive, whole body. So using the breath, it would be breathing in, experiencing the whole body, nothing left out. Breathing out, experiencing the whole body. So it's the continuity of awareness with the whole body, the experience of sitting, the, physical experience of sitting, not my idea of sitting, not a mental image of sitting, but the tactile experience of sitting. And that allows for a real healing coming together of the body and the mind. And you know this is happening when you begin to experience some calm in the body. So that's the next thing. So we go from a specific anchor, a little training and non-distraction, to a more inclusive anchor, like the whole body as you breathe in and out, noticing calm, noticing joy, noticing a more resonant happiness. Usually we translate sukha as the Pali word as ease or uh, contentedness, easeful contentedness of the heart. And that ease is what leads to a more spacious, dispassionate relationship to all the other mental activity. Because you might have noticed thinking isn't going to end anytime quick. So it's not about stopping thinking. It's about having a lot of space, dispassionate space with the thinking that's there. And that's what quiets the mind down, the thinking mind down. The thinking mind doesn't get quiet because I want my thinking mind to get quiet. Me wanting my thinking mind to get quiet is agitating. And besides that, it's a thought. I want my thinking mind to be quiet. That's just a thought. What actually quiets the thinking mind, slowly, gradually with practice, is learning to be really spacious and dispassionate about all the mental activity, mental and emotional activity. Oh yeah, that's what the thinking mind does, it thinks. That's what the emoting heart does, it emotes. Maybe it's okay for thinking emotions to be moving. That kind of dispassion and space, spaciousness, because now thoughts, the thinking process, isn't being fed by attachment and, and identification. And that's what begins to quiet it down. And then that leads onward toward that, what Kabir was talking about, the deepening of understanding, because when there's experience, plus this knowledge, this pointing out that where the Buddha is saying that it's just nature, it's not so personal, then that's what begins to be discerned in that more subtle state when the mind is really dispassionate. But until that point, our mind is, the clarity of awareness is distorted because the mind is always reacting to the thoughts that are being thought and it distorts the clarity. So the emphasis and quietness, it's not so much that there aren't thoughts, although they do really quiet down at some times at least, but the not being pushed around, not being distorted by the thoughts. One of my teachers, Joseph Goldstein once said, it's like someone left a radio on, you know, and it's not only that, it's a radio and they're speaking a language you don't understand, you can really let it be in the background. But if it's a language you understand, you know, it's like, what are they saying? Do I agree? Do I disagree? It's really hard to be aware of language without our mind gripping it. So it takes some practice. And the real key to the, what the Buddha discovered is connecting with the more resonant inner happiness of ease, sukha, then um, causes 
the mind to be less interested in its ongoing thinking, its ongoing dialogue, narration, the spewing of mental proliferation. It's just like, let it be background noise, like the wind or the rustling of leaves, right? Because thinking is as much of nature as nature is, as the rustling of leaves. Okay, now it's your turn. So what have you been learning? What questions are emerging in your practice? What challenges are coming up for you? Yeah, any comments? Feel free to just unmute yourselves. Really appreciate your comments, Kyle. Um, yeah, and it really, you know, it really, the, the, the kind of meditation instructions each of us take up has to be uh, it has to be in alignment with our temperament and even more specifically how we're doing that day and uh, when the mind is giving us a lot of pushback we really have to listen and so when there's some resistance that isn't necessarily the time to pick up and use a very structured meditation practice like we did tonight. I don't know if anybody read that book a long time ago, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. It is really an influential book written. I mean, it was really just a transcription of Q&A sessions with Suzuki Roshi. He was the founder of the San Francisco Zen Center. He was a Japanese man who came to America in the early 60s and started the San Francisco Zen Center, which has had quite an influence on Buddhist teachings in America. And he gives us a simile in that about, you know, how do you keep a cow from breaking out of the pasture? You give it a very big pasture, right? And it's sometimes when there's anxiety, then you can just, it just depends. Sometimes when there's a lot of anxiety, the mind really wants something to do. You know, it wants a more specific task, then try that. But sometimes when there's a lot of anxiety, the mind wants a really big space, not being told what to do. Hey, mind, heart, why don't you just hang out here in the present moment and do whatever you want and be aware of what you're doing, right? So you're still practicing, but the practice is like to be aware of what is happening, right? So, but then once you, whatever you end up doing, you're still going to kind of go through the same, but the only difference is what the anchor is. Like if you're using a really spacious approach, as opposed to when we worked with non-distraction, we had a very specific anchor. And that can be triggering for some minds in some moments. So give your mind the biggest anchor of all. What's the biggest meditation anchor? Okay, honey, speak into our heart. Honey, you just have to be aware of the present moment. So we're not giving any specificity to what that means. Any aspect of the present moment or the totality of the present moment, it will be fine. So here, it's not, you're not directing the attention. You're just noticing this is the present moment. And the non-distractedness is to keep noticing this is the present moment. This is how it is. Now it's like this. And you might cycle through anxiety and self-consciousness, and then it might be something else, and then something else. But the mind is, in a sense, following the thread of this is the present moment being known. And then you're going to go through the same things. It will be that, that integration because part of the present moment you realize is this uh, deepening sense of calm, like I belong in the present moment. And it's felt energetically or bodily, that calm, like, because the body is sort of the mind symbol for here and now. That's why the Buddha makes a big deal about embodiment. Calm. And so that sequence of breaking the spell of distraction 
by connecting with the present moment and sustaining. You got to do that one way or another. And then the telltale signs are the development of calm, some lightness of the heart, some more of resonant ease in the heart, more spacious, dispassionate quality in the heart and mind more realizing the empty space of the heart. And by that, we didn't talk about that in the guided meditation, it's just the next step. It's really seeing the mind empty of self-centered activity because it's gone quiet. So we're getting to know what is the mind or what is the heart when it isn't involved in self-centered activity. That's a real uh, transforming insight because the honest truth is it, it generally doesn't happen very often that our mind is mostly free of neurotic, self-centered activity. And when those, there are moments of that, we tend not to notice them. Like we might have a moment of real freedom where the mind doesn't have much self-centered activity, but we'll just sort of rationalize it. Well, it was such a beautiful sunset, you know, and the self-centered activity dropped away for a moment because it was so beautiful. But we, we, we imagine that it's because it was so beautiful that that moment was special. But what made it special was there was no self-centered activity for a few moments. And the mind felt the freedom of that. The mind wasn't neurotically trying to make the moment different than it was. It was truly at peace with things. And that's a moment of insight that really begins to transform our understanding does that kind of get at what you were asking, Kyle? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. What else comes to mind? What else would you like to share or questions that are emerging? Glad you say that, Ingrid. And that's it's sort of back to Kyle's point because um, some people really relish and thrive in that structure, you know, getting a very complete analytical map, let's call it. It really helps them. And other people it really triggers self-doubt or anxiety or, you know, all kinds of not helpful qualities. So it's really everybody, listen, you know, even in this class, you're getting a lot of different instructions. Like even in the sit tonight, you had a very specific body scan. And then even when we were working with the breath, we did lots of different things with that breath. You know, really in a more specific way, we were with it. Then these emotional qualities of calm, joy, ease, dispassion. So there's a lot there. And then we did kind of an open awareness practice for the last few minutes, right? So this is the downside that you're getting a lot of different, what we call skillful means, and it will be confusing. But the key is put most of it on the shelf and work with the stuff that for whatever reason, just resonate, you're attracted to, right? And then as you kind of dig in the few places that you just had a natural attraction to, some of the other stuff may start making sense or it may not. But over the course of years of practice, all that stuff you put on the shelf, all of a sudden it starts to fit in, right? Very difficult to do. It's not complicated so much what I'm saying, but it's one thing to hear it and it's another thing to do it. There is nothing more worthy of our respect than the force of our habits of distraction and entanglement. Basically the mind, the thinking mind chasing its likes and dislikes we can endlessly entertain ourselves, fantasizing, worrying, planning, wondering, imagining. And the thing is, the terrible thing is, if we actually took a look at most of that mental proliferation, we'd notice that it's stressful. But yet, we fill up most of our life with it. And so, it's a little bit, I was going to say this in response to Kyle's comment, it's a little bit like, you know, we've been living in a way with mental habits, emotional habits that are stressful. So when we take a class like this and we're kind of being encouraged to turn around and feel 
what it feels like to have been living the way I've been living, it's often claustrophobic, it's often intense, it's often difficult. It kind of depends a little bit of where you are in your life, but a good portion of the people when they start practice, it's very unpleasant. But fortunately, people who stick with it, they sense that it's the kind of pain that's healing, the kind of discomfort or intensity that is good to feel, even though it's not easy to feel. Because it's, we're overcoming deep habit of distraction and mental proliferation back toward the moment, back toward the mind. Glad you came, Ingrid. Time for a couple more folks to speak. Um, hi, I'm very new to meditation. Um, and I've noticed that whenever I start meditating, I can't stop yawning. I was wondering if you had any insights into that. Yeah, I mean, assuming that you're getting decent sleep. Um, yeah, I'm not tired. It's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's kind of common. And here's the thing, and it, it actually, these things are all connected, what people are bringing up. Because when we have a sense, like I'm, a, I'm presuming then that you're actually having some real sense of being present and that the yawning is arising related to being present. Does that seem correct? Yes, it does. Yeah. So the system, when... Uh, I like to say sometimes that that present moment awareness or mindful awareness is like a universal solvent. And I might have even mentioned this last week, like water and chemistry and earth science is a universal solvent. Water has this amazing capacity over time to dissolve things. And in terms of sp the spiritual world, this stable, kind, non-judging, even steady mindful awareness it will whatever is bound up will begin to unwind and when that unwinding happens it might be movement in the body it might be yawning's quite common it might be tears flowing some people fits of laughter but and other people just feeling a lot of intense and sometimes quite uh beautiful energetic movements, waves of sensation. But what is bound up in the kind of in the field of loving, stable, present moment awareness will unwind. You and I, we don't do the unwinding. Unwinding will happen when there is this open space, this wise space of awareness. And it can feel quite weird, weird in the sense of unfamiliar, what happens, like incessant yawning um, that this person is mentioning. But we can always go back to, am I doing anything weird? No, I'm not doing anything weird. I'm just sitting in a relaxed way, cultivating present moment awareness. So if, if that leads to incessant yawning, who am I to say it shouldn't be happening? You know, it's not like we're doing anything weird. Or if it leads to some times where there's a lot of shaking in the body or a lot of sadness and tears, maybe something that was bound up is unbinding itself. Great. Great. Who am I to not trust what seems like such a natural process? Right? It's uncontrived. I'm not trying to make something happen. It's just happening. And this is the thing with the practice generally. We have to really trust that there's nothing weird or harmful about cultivating present moment awareness, the stability, sensitivity of present moment awareness, because it gets intense sometimes, not always. Sometimes what's really intense is how boring it is. I'm sure some of you experience that. But if you stick with it, it's going to be everything under the sun, extreme boredom, extreme intensity, extreme beautiful experience, extreme difficult experiences, really, everything under the sun. And then wisdom has to know, you know what? I'm not going to stop now. All I'm doing is cultivating present moment awareness. If that's going to get me in trouble, 
I'm already screwed. Like if being present to life is dangerous, we're totally screwed. It's not dangerous, but it does lead to the deepest kind of spiritual healing. And that's a, it takes a lot of courage to do this work. That's why most of us, most of the time, choose a life of distraction and superficiality. Yeah, we have time for one more comment if, if there's anything someone would like to bring up before we close off our evening. That's a good question. And it's subtle, but it's, it's actually really important, Shannon, and I'm glad you brought it up. So the difference between mindfulness and consciousness. So, and again, we're just deciding to use these words this way. Not everybody maybe in the world uses these words the same way I'm going to. But in Buddhism, we have to be really specific so that we don't get confused about the practice. So consciousness, in a very simple way, is what illuminates. So we have a sensitive heart and the sensitive heart or sensitive mind is coming into contact with experience. And what allows that experience to be known, perceived, is what we call consciousness. It sort of illuminates the sensitivity with the object it's sensitive to. Like I'm sensitive to sight and I can be aware of seeing. So what makes it mindfulness, because like I mentioned that example of driving home, consciousness is happening. The eyes are seeing that experiences the mind is knowing on some level. It becomes mindful awareness when the mind knows that it's being known. So it has this mindfulness means it's this reflective knowing. The word sati, which we translate to be mindfulness, it comes from the root of remembering. So we're remembering that this is being known. We're remembering that the present moment is like this. Because there's always a present moment, but how many moments are we mindful and we know that this is being known? That's a more rare occurrence. Now with practice, like the six-week course, you'll start noticing more moments during the day where there's consciousness, but now there's mindfulness too. So the mind knows that this is being known. You might be walking under some beautiful trees and then a moment of mindfulness will arise and you'll know green is like this. Fluttering of light through the trees is like this. Hearing the sound is like this. Right? We'll know what the mind is knowing. That makes it mindful awareness. Yeah, thanks Shannon. I'm glad you brought that up. Just remember next Tuesday, you might have all kinds of brilliant excuses not to come back, but just notice that those thoughts are just thoughts being known. Oh yeah, resistance. This is what resistance looks like. Give it six weeks, do what you can each day, a little bit each day. And in particular now, really look for that sequence of non-distract play lightly with non-distractedness, Notice the calming effect. Notice the joy. Notice some ease. Notice a sense of space. So if you can remember some of these five qualities, it's kind of the natural progression when you're getting some continuity of mindful awareness. But it takes time, as people have said. So nice to be with you all. Hope to see you next Tuesday evening. Thanks, everybody.